thank you, Sammy. That was uh, revealing, to say the least. Can you hear me? Yeah? Is this working? Yeah? I'd like to invite John Schotter and Harleen Anderson to offer some of their reflections, comments, ideas. Thank you. <laughs> Is this working? Hello. Yeah? Thank you. And thank you, especially for your encouraging words at the end, because I was sitting there thinking, wow. And he said, don't give up hope at the beginning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I mean, uh, I, I have in my uh, comment that I made to this uh, group uh, this, this morning, I was just stay communicating, stay mm -hmm. listening, stay reading, stay doing the stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. But do you want to go first, Harley? I don't mind. I have some random, somewhat connected and somewhat disconnected thoughts. One of the things that I was thinking is how we, meaning those of us sitting in this room and our colleagues in the broader fields, perpetuate these myths that are going around. How do we participate in that? And how do we participate in that in permeating the larger social and cultural discourses? In other words, we're creating our own monster. Um, uh, I'm pretty old. <laughs> Uh, believe it or not, uh, back in 1982, I, I was asked to contribute uh, to a book by somebody in the uh, London Business School called Emancipation in Organisations. Um, and I'd like to make some comments, uh, not so much uh, on the, the effect of clients, but uh, on the effect of us as, as participation, uh, as part practitioners uh, within these these kinds of organizations. Um, the title of the uh, chapter I wrote for this book, which in the end wasn't published, it was thought a little bit too radical by the publishers, but the title uh, I uh, uh, selected was uh, The Manufacture of Personhood and the Institutionalization of mutual humiliation. Um, and <laughs> I, I went back in history uh, and I collected a few quotations from various uh, people who have been extremely influential in uh, the way organizations get structured. Uh, and I thought, can I, Harleen, just take a little bit of time uh, and read out just uh, one or two of them. Um, this is one from Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations. Uh, and you know the whole idea of breaking down any complex activity into a sequence of very simple steps. And Adam Smith said, uh, in the progress of the division of labor, the employment of the far greater part of these who live by labor is that the great body of people come to be defined, to, uh, confined to a very few simple operations, and so on and so on and so on. The man whose life is spent in performing a few simple operations has no occasion to exert his understanding. He naturally loses, therefore, the habit of such exertion and generally becomes as stupid and as ignorant as it's possible for a human creature to become. That's 1773. Uh, there was a guy called Dr. Andrew Ewer writing in uh, 1835, writing the philosophy of manufacturers. And uh, he, was, uh, he said something uh, similar to, to Adam Smith about uh, people operating these, uh, these step-by-step recipes and protocols and tick box structures um, becoming as... Uh, uh, being returned to, to the uh, uh, mental uh, level of, uh, of children. But he also said uh, many of the machines in the factory at the moment are rather difficult to operate uh, and uh, manufacturers should get children in to operate these machines so that their bodies will grow to fit the machines. <laughs> <laughs> 
But uh, another person I drew from, you'll all know of Frank Winslow Taylor. And uh, there's a report of his to the Congressional Committee in 1911. And he's talking also about uh, uh, skilled people having control over their own labor. And he's saying that uh, in these circumstances, skilled people having control over their labor means that management can't control their behavior. And he goes on to say, to change this situation, control over the labor part process must pass into the hands of management, not only in a formal sense, but by the control and dictation of each step in the process, including its mode of performance. You now must all conform to the manuals and the protocols and the tick box recipes. Management requires it. And he ended his uh, report to the Congressional Committee by saying, in the past, the man was first. In the future, the system will be first. There are millions of other comments I'd like to make, Sammy, but uh, I, I won't take up any more time for the moment. <laughs> I'll pass the mic back to you again. So I, I have a couple of thoughts about my question that are not original thoughts, but things that I would like to highlight. And I think that we live in a broader uh, cultures and societies, and certainly in professional ones, in which control, knowledge, and certainty are very important and that for the most part, we don't want to give up those things. And we perpetuate the myth that we have the knowledge, we know the best. And so, the, you want to say the general public, or the communities, the consumers, so to speak, then depend on us to have the knowledge. Whether you're talking about in the psychiatric field, or whether you're talking about in education, just look at any profession and how the broader public gives us the power, so to speak, to make decisions about their lives. Although I think one of the things that's happening, there was the notion of globalization mentioned, is that people around the world are now demanding to have more of a voice in what affects their lives in many ways. And I think that that's going to influence and trickle down to our more local level when we talk about uh, psychiatry. Also, in terms of not giving up, it was I was reading, um, I think also from the Royal College of Medicine, Maudsley, back in the 1870s, talked about um, a lot of things that we wouldn't agree with, but he talked about lunatic making asylums. Again, I think not talking about the asylum itself, but the people working and the people organizing it and the kind of culture that they create that they are creating the very people that they work with, and so the asylums became more custodial than anything else in terms of treatment or rehabilitation. And I think we do the same thing. What, one other comment about the general. Uh, Sheila used the word community earlier today, as did um, a couple of other people, I think. And you talked about moving into the community, and rather than trying to uh, have influence in our own voices or speaking to the choir, to begin to speak with other people and invite in those other voices in the, in the greater community. And I think that's one way we can have some influence. Um, when I was young, I, I, I certainly would be classed as something of a nerd. Uh, I am still something of a of a nerd, actually. <laughs> uh, but part of being nerdy is, is to look into the technical details of things. Um, and uh, uh, I, I noticed, Sami, uh, you uh, mentioned Thomas Kuhn. Uh, reading the preface of Kuhn, I, I noticed, which is the nerdy bit, <laughs> uh, that he was influenced by another book by somebody called Ludwig Fleck. Uh, at the time it was in German, hadn't been translated, uh, called The Origin and Genesis of a Scientific Fact. Uh, I, I, on the basis of the bit in the preface, I, I, I did read it. Um, and 
Where I now begin to think that people like Kuhn uh, are not appropriate models, because uh, Kuhn based all of his, uh, uh, what he was having to say uh, about science on experimental laboratory science, whereas Ludwig Fleck was talking about the emergence of the Wasserman reaction in a whole, what you might call, everyday life medical setting. And the whole influence on uh, how that uh, uh, reaction emerged as the standard reaction had a whole sort of historical and social life, which I think is much more appropriate to the kinds of issues that we have to worry about in how uh, uh, medical diagnosis, uh, to, to replace uh, uh, a medical diagnosis with um, uh, ordinary everyday life understanding of, of medical disturbances. Uh, I won't say any more. Would anyone like to uh, say something before we round off in a few minutes? Thank you, John, and thank you, Harleen. Thank you. Are there any other voices there? Uh, you said uh, NIMH is introducing new, new research criteria. I think we should uh, look what they are because we can think what was before the DSM-3, it was the DSM-2, and it was the distinction between psychosis and neurotic disorder, and DSM-3 became, uh, was done because we were unhappy with the distinction which was very also stigmatizing people. Now, we should be probably, we know since 25 years that the DSM brings nothing. Now you showed that uh, it brings worse thing. And we should be cautious what will be the next exactly. classification. And it came from DSM-2 to DSM-3 because the NIMH changed at that time because they said the people before were unscientific. Now, I don't agree that before man was first. In the Greek, it was a citizen who was first. Later, it was a king who was first. Later, in the 19th century, it was the white bourgeois who was first. Now, maybe sometimes men will be first, but this will be in the future, possibly. Okay. Any other voices? I think oh, there's, a, there's someone up there. I don't know if I'm going to get this mic to you. have to run. You do have a strong voice. Well, you can have a stronger by using the mic. <laughs> Standardizing protocols for treatment is the way into medicine and the medical practice by the industry. Because if they can get the protocols in, then the drugs follow, and then we all march in tune. So that's big business and big money entering. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other voices? I just want to say thank you. It made me more, how do you say it, hopeful than I have felt for a very long time. And I nearly also felt for going into figures, maybe, after listening to you. So yeah. thank you. Yes. They're on your side. Mm. OK, I'm doing this because uh, Karina is very hopeful. And I'm going up these stairs, <laughs> going to the back here. Oh, my goodness me. Yes, I, I have to say I completely agree. I feel very hopeful. And one of the things that I think is very exciting is that it is uh, people within 
the psychiatry who are rising up mm -hmm. and protesting. And uh, I think that's where you guys can make a huge influence and have a tremendous effect is because you are actually already inside. So if you create the rot and start to spread from the inside, wow, fantastic. We, the, uh, the hearing voices and everything, will work on the outside. And together, we will change. I really felt inspired by your talk. Good. Thank you. Good. <laughs> It's just a, a, a question, because I was wondering, you spoke about uh, ADHD and autism. When it comes to ADHD, there's a medical cure. But what about autism? What, is, what are the interests between pushing uh, autism as a label? Are there, are there any medi medication also for autism, or what's, what's it about? Um, it, did you mean, because there isn't a, a cure for ADHD, but there is the um, fiction of a specific treatment, or, although we, we know it's a, it's a non-specific treatment. Um, are you trying to wonder about where the drivers for autism might come? Because it, it's clearer to see that the drivers for ADHD might be in terms of the popularization of the pharmaceutical approach. Yeah. Uh, well, kind of this is, this was partly my point why at the, the start I wanted to contextualize this as being broader than just about making money, because making money is part of this. Um, but uh, the, the whole process of turning things into a commodity is more is more than just that. Uh, and so, w autism is an interesting one, and, and it's been a much more difficult one to critique than ADHD. I've been critiquing ADHD for a long time, and the press regularly come to me and ask me to give a comment on this and give a comment on that, because the because the the idea that there are conflicts of interest is easier to um, but autism holds a very high kind of status in some way because there isn't a particular, although the, 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 there is increasing use of antipsychotics in autism, particularly risperidone, which is a, a, another very worrying trend. Um, but it doesn't have the same status as uh, something that is a lot of money to be made for the pharmaceutical industry. But what you found, what has happened is that a whole industry has grown up around the concept of autism. So there are these tests that, that I, and you, you, you pay a lot of money to go on and train to deliver one of these tests. And, and these tests are fascinating because uh, at the end of doing this test, which often takes several hours and involves questions and observations and tasks and things like that, the diagnosis is made on the basis of clinical opinion. You still have to, you know, <laughs> and uh, I mean, it, it, it is really no different than, you know, you, you could still do it in 10 minutes if you really wanted to. Um, so, uh, so there is, there is an industry, there is a product and, and there is a, a sense of how it turns into people's identity and people who, um, you know, th th there is a, the National Autistic Society, and there's a lot of money now going into research, and that you know there's a whole industry that's, uh, and and as a product, it sells very well in the market. Certainly at the moment, there's a lot of demand for it. I'm going to butt in there and say, I can tell that there is caffeine jitters in this room, <laughs> and we're going to pause there. But but there's one more question coming up. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Um, I've been working for five years in a uh, psychiatric department where we used to do a lot of biological and neurobiological research. Uh, I agree with you, it was mainly rubbish with low uh, reliability, the methods were completely biased. Uh, the conclusions were overwhelming for the for the evidence we had. We were looking for uh, biological markers for ADHD, addiction, nothing at all. 
But my boss was a professor, one of the most powerful professors of psychiatry in Spain, and uh, he has power. He has money, he has power, the industry gives him money, the government gives him money, he's advisor for the Ministry of Health, for the uh, Region uh, Council for Health, etc., etc., etc. So I think one of the things, if, if we w really want to change things, because I mean, I can explain this to my colleagues or to my ex colleagues now in the in, in, in lecture in London in a much nice place, but uh, if we want to tell this uh, to our colleagues, it's not only telling this, but also, I mean, they want to have jobs. I have a lot of friends who are clinical psychologists or psychiatrists in Spain, and they want to have a job. And people giving them job is this kind of professors who are getting a lot of impact points from these publications, because you don't publish this in a clinical psychology journal. You publish this in biological psychiatry, molecular psychiatry, 15, 20 impact points. I have to, if we want to compete with that, we have to publish 20 papers. Maybe very interesting, uh, telling the narratives of our patients and so on, but he publishes just one with really a, a, a very low quality of uh, evidence, okay? And so how can we change this? How can we put power in professors who want to do another thing? I think he's just done that, don't you think? Because he's He's just been filmed saying this, mm. and he's now working in London. <laughs> and uh, we can we can get the address of his previous professor and send him the film. <laughs> well done. Well, j just briefly. Yes. I I, I quoted somebody who uh, I suspect um, in Peter Gotcha, or probably his pronounce it wrong, uh, Gotcha, um, who has uh, who I think you know, in terms of academic credentials would wipe the floor with your professor. Um, uh, I myself and many of us in the Critical Psychiatry Group have published in very high impact journals, including the British Medical Journal, British Journal of Psychiatry, Advances in Psychiatric Treatment, um, uh, uh, and, and other mainstream medical as well as psychiatric journals. So we're out there playing on that field. Can I you just know? interrupt there because I think that's just a lovely example of the psychotechnology mm. wars that go on. <laughs> well, I don't mm -hmm. think the publishing and the impact point yeah. and the powerful professors might be for another conference day. Let's go but it's an, important, it's an yes, important it's point. an important point. And it's 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 uh, it's partly what I'm trying to say. Thank you, yeah. Sammy. Thank you.